then at least in some small way, uh, fear is present in every newsroom in the country. A fear of losing your job, a fear of your the institution, the company you work for going out of business, the fear of being stuck with some label, unpatriotic or otherwise, that you will have with you to your grave and beyond, um, the, the fear that there's so much at stake for the country that by doing what you deeply feel is your job will sometimes be embarrassed at those. All of these things go into the mix, but it's very important for me to say, because I firmly believe it, I'm not the vice president in charge of excuses, <laughs> that we shouldn't have excuses. What we should do is take a really good look at that period and learn from it and, you know, suck up our courage. Charles Hanley, who won the Pulitzer Prize for reporting, was in Iraq in January of 2003, and he went to all the sites that had been named by Bush officials as suspicious sites, Al Tuwaitha and Fallujah. He went to every site that had been named by George Bush, Cheney, Rice, Colin Powell, and he found that in every case, they were still sealed since 1991 by when they had been sealed by UN inspectors. He filed a report on January 18th. It went to every major newsroom in the United States because it's the AP, which goes to every major newsroom in the United States. Got no pickup. It no didn't one published fit the script. It. it didn't fit the script. It got virtually no pickup. It didn't fit the script. We were going to war no matter what. I think that if that good media coverage, good journalism that tells truth to power can make a huge, huge difference. So do I think that we would have gone to war if the media had done their job and it challenged not just the lies about weapons of mass destruction, but the lies about how, how Saddam kicked the inspectors out in 1998 and the whole, the whole litany of propaganda that led up to uh, you know, March 20th, 2003, the launch of the war. I think if the media had been challenging that, there's no, I, I think we would not have gone to war. Jeremy Paxman said last year he and the rest of the media had been hoodwinked in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. Is that something that you would agree with? Um, well, what I think I would say about that is that clearly we did not realise until much later in the day uh, that the weapons of mass destruction were not there. And of course there was the so-called dodgy dossier as mm. well. So mm. there is quite a body of evidence to build up to suggest mm. that the media certainly were taken in by the claims that were uh, coming from government at that point, yes. Why didn't the media get it? Why didn't the BBC get it? I think that we didn't get it partly because of lack of access. If you want to find out what's happening, then you really need to go there and do some first-hand reporting, uh, which wasn't possible in the run-up to the war in Iraq. But the crucial facts were available. The chief United Nations weapons inspector in Iraq, Scott Ritter, gave me this interview four years before the invasion. In 1991, Iraq had significant capability in the area of chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons production capability, and long-range ballistic missile manufacturing capability. By 1998, the chemical weapons infrastructure had been completely dismantled or destroyed by UNSCOM or by Iraq in compliance with UNSCOM's mandate. The biological weapons program had been declared in its totality late in the game, but it was gone. All the major facilities eliminated. The nuclear weapons program, again, completely eliminated. The long-range ballistic missile program, completely eliminated. All that was left was the research and development and manufacturing capability for missiles with a range less than 150 kilometers, a permitted activity. Everything that we set out to destroy in 1991, the physical infrastructure had been eliminated. So if I had to quantify Iraq's threat in terms of weapons of mass destruction, the real threat is zero, none. The former chief weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, was saying as early as 1998 that Saddam Hussein was completely disarmed. Scott Ritter, I think, appeared in 2003 twice 
and once at three in the morning on uh, BBC 24 News. He was a vital expert witness, and there were others. Well, I don't know why Scott Ritter didn't appear more, but it, he clearly did well, appear a, at that's times. that's the question for the BBC. Why, why weren't those who were witnesses... Why weren't those witnesses? voices heard? Yes. Well, because there were also other voices that we were putting on the air, Unscombe, Mohammed al Baraday, Hans Blix. So we were actually listening to, to those voices. But, yeah, I think you've got a good point. You know, why, why didn't we? It's a question that we asked ourselves afterwards. Why was it that we didn't discover this first, uh, didn't discover the state of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction? I think what, what critics of that would say is that the broadcasters, notably the BBC, echoed or amplified the lies told in the run-up to the invasion, rather than investigating itself. What the BBC, though, have a duty to do is to report what governments and their representatives are saying, which we, of course, did. We were just reporting, quite legitimately, the claims that people at the time were making. They weren't legitimate claims, though. They were in the mouths of legitimate leaders, though, and therefore we had a duty to report that. But those leaders, both of them you mentioned, Blair and Bush, have long been discredited. I mean, isn't it the BBC's role, as well as reporting what politicians say, to hold power to account? Of course it is. It's, always, it's, our, it's the BBC's duty to scrutinise what it is that people say. We're not there to accuse them of lying, though, because that's a judgment. No, 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 that's not being suggested, that you make a judgment. The point is that it appears now that those important journalistic challenges were never made. It's not up to me to make a judgment. We're there to report what their claims are and hold them up to scrutiny uh, and, and investigate. In August 2002, ITV reported a warning by Vice President Cheney that Iraq would soon have a nuclear weapon. And that was nonsense. But it was presented uncritically as news. Wouldn't you say that that contributed to the, the invasion that happened the following March? Well, it might have done, but with respect, not our fault. I mean, I, I don't believe that you're suggesting, are you, that we should completely dismiss the words of arguably the second most powerful man in the Western world. We uh, reported no. it. We didn't necessarily agree with it. We reported it and, uh, 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 and allowed our viewers to make up their minds as to whether this was a man telling the truth or not. No, but, that, but that's not fair on viewers, is it? Because they may not know what we as journalists know or ought to know that this was an extremely well, dodgy yeah. politician well, who was making, it, was making extraordinary claims. If we knew it, we should yeah. have said so. If mm. we didn't know it, we can't. And that applies across everything. Um, but you're absolutely right in one regard. We shouldn't take things at face value. We should do our best to investigate. And when we do know, we should tell our viewers. Of course we should. That's part of the, the process of being uh, a journalistically based organisation. I mean, I was thinking of... Uh, of Blair's many statements. One, on the 29th of January 2003, ITV News reported Blair as saying, we do know of links between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. Mm. These links, as you know, didn't exist. I mean, we're getting into the realms of, of, of sort of semantics now, but if... Well, he, they're he, well, very important well, no, semantics, He, he used they? the word links mm. between the two. Your quotation, not mine. Well, I think that was a quotation from yeah, ITV from Tony News. Blair. Yeah, yeah, from Tony Blair. Yeah. Links. Now, links can mean a thousand things. It doesn't necessarily mean a bond of support. Of there were no support. links. Well, I, look, I'm sitting here across you. You're telling me that. I would say to you, well, show me that there were no links. Show me that they'd never... Oh. Show oh. me that they'd never... Even those claiming links said there, there were no links. There never been <laughs> any communications of any kind between those two organisations. Come on. It's impossible to do that. And he okay. chose his words carefully. And of course... Well, we're, they're not we're, careful. We're, we're, we do know of links between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. Yeah, but the word links yeah. could mean a thousand things, is the no. point I'm saying here. Okay. And you're not suggesting, I'm sure, that we shouldn't have reported what the Prime Minister was saying. You were talking about semantics a little while ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I find it virtually impossible to believe that Britain could have got away with the invasion of Iraq um, if the media had been doing its job. When Blair 
was standing up and saying our, our, our policy in the region was to bolster, bolster the forces of democracy, I mean, really, the proper reaction to that would have been to burst out laughing. <clears throat> There's simply no history of that at all. Britain has, has been on the side of authoritarian, repressive regimes. They are our allies, the Omanis, the Saudis, the Egyptians. They are our allies, not the, the more democratic, more liberal forces in the region. And I think that if journalists had even had a, 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 a slight uh, interest in looking at the history and in looking at, the, at, at, at what, uh, the, what the government was actually saying at the time or what the evidence was at the time, they would have reported things in such a manner that the government just would not have been able to have got away with what they did. Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome to the Don Buster. This was the Vietnam War, which I reported. A new military jargon, collateral damage, was designed for the media and to cover up the scale of the industrial killing of up to three million people and the terror of indiscriminate bombing, often known as turkey shoots. The longest bombing campaign in history happened here, in North Vietnam, mostly unseen from outside. This is a photograph of the town of Ham Long in the north. Not a building remained, only bomb craters. Pictures like this were seldom published. Vietnam was the blueprint for the wars of today. Murder and destruction replaced military tactics. Almost every man, woman and child became the enemy. It's time that we recognized ours was in truth a noble cause. As in previous wars, public memory of the Vietnam War was greatly influenced by Hollywood. The Deer Hunter, Platoon, Good Morning Vietnam, The Green Berets. All these films perpetuated an illusion, turning fiction into truth. The theme was fake heroism and self-pity. The invader as victim, purged of all crime. Today, a series of Iraq war movies follows the tradition. The current Oscar winner, The Hurt Locker, is the familiar story of a psychopath high on violence in somebody else's country, where the suffering of its people barely exists. What I saw was a film that was a complete uh, celebration of the lone lunatic, but who ultimately, you know, is the quintessential American hero. Because uh, lone lunatics are very big in this country. We even elect them president sometimes. This film is a film about killing, in which killing is completely incidental. And this is a war that was orchestrated purely for profit and for oil and for ownership of other people's resources and for control of global resources. This is another war we don't see in Britain. In this video, British soldiers are abusing Iraqi civilians. A public inquiry into the killing of Baha Musa, an Iraqi hotel worker, has been told that British soldiers have tortured and killed prisoners. Phil Shiner is the lawyer acting for more than a hundred Iraqi families. Modern democracies don't leave marks, so stealth torture. Um, so the things that we developed and we weren't alone, the Americans did the same, obviously. And much more subtle, it, leaving someone hooded, putting someone to a wall standing position, depriving them of food and water, etc. My clients complain of every type of threat. 
that your women will be brought here and raped in front of you, that, you know, death...